Hello, I'm Zeke with the Eastside Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas. Thanks for joining us for another lesson in our 2020 annual congregational theme. This year it's Seeing God's Will with 2020 Vision. And you know, our theme, based on the metaphor of 2020 vision or clear vision because of the year, uh, was one that was adopted by many other congregations. But I'll tell you what, as clever as a lot of us thought that that kind of a theme would be, 2020, none of us could see what the year 2020 could bring. No one could have foreseen it. And it's been a, a trifecta of seas for us here, in the at least in the Gulf of Mexico. Of course, there's been COVID, which has been all over the country. It's been a, a crazy election cycle, not to mention the cyclones that have been coming up through the Gulf of Mexico when the price of which many are still paying. However weak our predictive abilities, though, still, we can see God's will clearly. We can see God's will with 2020 vision in spite of the turmoil and uncertainties that the year 2020 has inflicted upon us. What we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at a short psalm, Psalm 121, Psalm 121. And Psalm 121 contains phrases that remind us of, of someone who was on a, a literal journey, even as we make the application to our spiritual journey. More importantly, though, we need to be reminded of the help that God provides as we make it through the perils of our spiritual journey, and we do it faithfully. The perils of this year have caused a lot of people to lower their sights, to forget about things that are ultimately more important, to dwell too much on earthly safety and comfort, while unfortunately neglecting faith. So what we're going to get, I hope, from Psalm 121 is the idea that we need to lift up our eyes. We need to look higher. And the first thing that we'll notice right out of the gate in Psalm 121 is that we can lift up our eyes because God is my helper. Look with me, if you will, in the first couple of verses. The psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. Now one can imagine the traveler looking up to the hills on every side of him, uh, maybe wondering if there was some danger lurking there. And so the question arises, where, where will my help come if there is danger? Well, when he looks up, instead of seeing danger, the answer comes, quick and clear. My help is from God. The Lord is my helper. While people travel through life, we should recognize that, that trouble meets us everywhere. And it's going to cause us to look for different ways to cope. And because of that, there is no shortage of self-help books. Books on every bookshelf and every bookstore that will help you get through the turmoils of life. And sometimes people look for the help that they need in life in those books. Sometimes they look for the help that they need in relationships, whether it's it's in a marriage or or a friendship. Uh, maybe it's in different methods of, of coping, like meditation or uh, maybe even in materialism. The very idea that we could just keep buying stuff and if we surround ourselves with enough stuff, then I'll feel better about it. Sometimes we invest a lot of trust in leaders and presidents and senators and mayors and governors. And sometimes we even place a lot of trust in religion, whether or not it's, it's true religion. Well, if we're expecting God to be our helper, then we've got to rely on the things that he's made available for us. And of course, since this is the year we're talking about God's will, we should recognize that God has made available for us help through His Word. In Ephesians chapter 4, leave a marker in Psalm 121 if you would, because we're going to be back there. But over in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 3, in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse, in verse 4, 
Paul the Apostle talks about the things that he had written before in brief, and he said, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. So, Paul says, what I wrote to you is something that reveals something that was once a mystery, but it's not anymore. It's been revealed in the apostles and the prophets. We've given this to you so that you can know by referring to what you read exactly what God wills. We can know. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to go there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul talks about what God has revealed. And we ought to just marvel at the fact that God has made His will known to us. Think about it for a moment. The perfect mind of God has been laid out to us in a way that we can understand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, the apostle says, We do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom with which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, just as it is written, Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. He goes on to remind us that the Spirit reveals to us the, the deep things that are in the mind of God. But let's just think about this for a moment. Paul has reminded us that what he had delivered for people to understand was not worldly wisdom, was not what you could find from any cornerstand philosopher. Instead, what he, what he delivered, he said, was from the very mind of God, the wisdom from God that was hidden but is hidden no more. In fact, he tells us that it has been revealed, prepared for those who love him, in verse 9. And God revealed those things, he says in verse 10, through the Spirit, so we can know what God requires. And, and why? So that we can have strength from God for the journey. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you're still in 1 Corinthians, I hope, make a, make a right, just a, a, a few pages, to chapter 10. And notice with me what the apostle says in verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Now that way of escape comes to us, I'm going to submit through the Word of God. We get our strength of courage. We get a conscience from informing that conscience with the Word of God. We know what God wants, and thereby it becomes for us our conscience, our courage, and our strength. It helps us to realize what it is that we need to say no to and what it is that we need to embrace. And whenever difficulties come upon us, whatever suffering the apostle might be referring to here in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, whatever temptation or enticement he may be speaking of, we know for sure that God has given us all the resources we need to withstand that. Not to deliver us out of the trouble, but to help us maintain our faith while we are in the trouble in order for us to, to get through it. And it's important for us to realize that no matter where we go, no matter what we face, rather, there is no place where we can go for sure help other than God Almighty. And we should realize also that God never promises physical or financial security. We can find strength in spite of the fact that everything around us seems to be falling apart, even our own health. But He does promise that He's going to provide all the resources that we need for spiritual stability. Which brings us to the next point in Psalm 121. The psalmist goes on to say that God is not only my helper, God is my stability. In verse 3, he says, He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, 
He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Now, the roads in Israel were sometimes steep and twisted and treacherous, and it's easy to imagine that somebody could lose their footing and fall down, scrape a knee, or break a leg, or worse, lose their life. But God is pictured here as a watchman, somebody who, who keeps them on solid ground. And even as we consider our own spiritual journey, it's easy to take our eyes off the path and lose our own footing. That's why God promises us a sure footing. We're going to make a left to another psalm. This time, this time Psalm 37. Psalm 37. In Psalm 37, we're going to begin in verse 23. In Psalm 37, verse 23, the psalmist says, The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When he falls, he'll not be hurled headlong, because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, or his descendants begging bread. All day long he is gracious and lends, and his descendants are a blessing. Depart from evil and do good, so you will abide forever. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. No, we'll stop there. But notice some things that the psalmist reminds us of as he he reaffirms for us the the stability the sure place that God sets us on he reminds us of the fact that somebody whose ways are established by God can be secure in his life in spite of whatever may be happening all around him he can know that if he walks in God's way God is going to maintain a path for him that is sure that is right that is stable and it's not that troubles don't come. Of course, we know that they do. But he's able to avoid some missteps and even cope when perhaps some missteps do occur. He's able to deal with the troubles that pop up. And we're told here that God is going to maintain his security. In verse 25, he says, I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. Now, there's a physical aspect to this. Sometimes when, when Christians are in need, when those who are God's people are in need, God will provide for that need through his other children. But the idea here is that God is a watchful God. He keeps his eye on those who are completely his. And I'll tell you, it's because of what he says in verse 31 that makes all the difference. The law of his God is in his heart, and that's why his steps do not slip. I want to tell you, you and I both know that the world that we live in is on a downhill slide. It is, at least in our American society, it is one that is deeply in need of moral stability. Our leaders have largely lost their way, and people don't know which way to turn to find someone or something that is trustworthy, that is, that is good enough to place all their trust in. And that's why the scripture reminds us that for the one who trusts completely in God, even while the world around us, our society is in a moral morass. We can be a beacon of spiritual constancy for others to see. In 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to go all the way back to the New Testament and look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter 1. In 2 Peter 1, beginning in verse 10, after Peter had reminded us of those things that are called the, the Christian virtues, he reminds us to keep those things before us always so that we don't forget about our purification in verse 9. In verse 10, he says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, 
the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. He reminds us of the fact that there is a way that we can walk and be sure of. And as long as we keep on that right way, he says, we will never stumble. Now, understand, he is not promising we will never sin. The idea here is that we will always have a sure way. We will always know which way to turn and where to go. And that's only by keeping, by being diligent ourselves, by keeping it in front of us all the time. And that certainly goes for a religious stability that we need. Now, 2020 has been a tough year for religious people. Well, it's been tough for everybody, but especially for those with a a spiritual view. We've seen pressure to abandon responsibility to God and I believe that eventually it's going to get worse. I believe that, that in spite of the fact that, that spiritually minded people were once looked up to, in fact, having a religious mindset was once considered to be a virtue, we're seeing more and more and more where, where, where people are not just downplaying religion, they're trying to squelch it, they're trying to squash it, and they're trying to, to do whatever they can to keep people of faith silent. What would we do if... Instead of as we've seen our worship services restricted, we had to make some adjustments. What would do we what would we do if our worship was not merely restricted but shut down completely? I've heard lots of folks say, uh, we ought to obey God rather than men, from what Peter said in Acts five and verse 29. And that's true. We ought to obey God rather than men. But would we? I know of Christians in places where Christianity, at least publicly, is accepted, but really privately is illegal. Places like Vietnam or China, where Christians fear for their lives but still they worship in person. Would we? Would we brave that kind of danger in order to obey God rather than men? We know that God has provided everything that we need to obey Him in every circumstance, so that even if the world does unravel completely, faith and faithfulness can remain secure. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 12. Make a left with me just a few pages to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. In verse 25, as the Hebrew writer encourages Christians who were thinking of lowering their sights and abandoning Christianity, he reminds them of something very important. He says in verse 25, See to it that you do not refuse him who was speaking, For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he is promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. We're reminded in Hebrews 12 and the verses that we just read that things are going to get worse, and one day they're going to get so bad that this earth will cease to exist. Things will be shaken for once and for all, finally, one day, but there will be one that remains. The kingdom, the true kingdom, and those who were in it. And that's the kingdom I want to be in. In spite of the the instability of this world, in spite of the shakiness of all that we see that goes on in this world, I want to know that there is stability and constancy that I can look to in spite of the turmoil that, that swirls around us. Back in Psalm 121, 
Finally, the psalmist reminds us that not only is God helper, God is stability, but he says, God is my protector. In verse 5 of Psalm 121, he says, Yahweh is your keeper. Yahweh is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. Yahweh will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. Yahweh will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Again, there is no promise that there is going to be absence of turmoil and trouble in life. But it is a promise that when you need it, there's going to be help of a sort that you can't get anywhere else but from God and that will carry you through whatever threatens you. And the New Testament tells us of the protection that God has put in place so that we can know that when something comes to assault our faith, we'll be ready. Some of that is the armor of God that God has provided. In Ephesians chapter 6, go there with me. In Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, we're reminded of where our strength lies. In Ephesians 6 and verse 10, the apostle says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, stop there for just a moment and and recognize what he says is ready to assault us. All these unseen things. And how much easier would it be if our foe was a human foe? How much easier would it be to know that all we had to do was take up a bazooka or or a, a, a... some sort of 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 assault rifle and just go after some other human enemy but he says no it's different our fight is spiritual and god provides for us just the kind of of weapons that we need to fight this fight and so he says in verse 13 therefore take up the full armor of god so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Now, Paul reminds us here that for everything that those unseen forces hurl at us, God has provided for us something with which we can ward them off. And lest we forget, prayer is one of those effective tools by which we can ward off those things that the enemy hurls at us. Did you notice how often in this passage we were reminded that it's in the Lord, it's in His might, It's the armor of God. We need to be reminded that God is our protector because he is in control. In Romans chapter 8, go there with me. In Romans chapter 8, towards the end of that chapter, the apostle reminds us that we can know for sure that no matter what stands before us, God will help us. In Romans 8, beginning in verse 26, he reminds us that the Spirit helps our weaknesses and intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. In verse 28, he says, We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. And then he goes on to tell us that the purpose of God is a progression 
It is a process by which we, come, we become more and more conformed to the image of his son. And then he goes on to remind us that there is no one who can stand against us. Because after all, he asks in verse 31, if God is for us, who can possibly stand against us? And he reminds us in verse 37 that in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why? Because God is absolutely in control. Now, it doesn't mean that he's going to make everything happen, but we partner with him, trusting him and recognizing that as long as we do, He's going to bring us safely through. And so we can know that what we entrust to him is well kept. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, go there with me. 2 Timothy chapter 1. In 2 Timothy 1, we're going to look beginning in verse 12. The apostle says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me. I'm sorry, I said 2 Timothy, didn't I? That's 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. He says, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Now, Paul says, I believe God, and I know for sure that I can trust him. And he says, I've entrusted to him something very special. And think about, what is it that we entrust to God? Our very selves, our souls, the most precious that of which we are. Paul says, I know that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. So the question is not whether God will deliver on his promises. The question is, will I live up to my end of the covenant. Look at one more passage with me, if you will, in Jude, the little book, the little book of Jude. Little book of Jude, just before the book of Revelation. In Jude, verse 20, as Jude draws this short letter to a close, he says, but you, beloved, Building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. We can know for sure that if we just entrust ourselves to God and do those things that he said, if we continue worshiping him just as he said we should, if we continue obeying him in all the things that he's laid out for us concerning his will, if we just stick to him if we in short lift up our eyes to him then we know for sure that he'll show us the way and he'll bring us safely through with a steadfast heart with a steadfast heart and a determined resolve we can see god's will clearly in spite of the turmoil of the times that we're living in most importantly though We can not just see God's will, we can do God's will, if we're willing. I hope you're willing. We can depend on Him. So the question is, can He depend on us to trust Him and to lift up our eyes? Thanks for joining us today. Hope we'll see you again. God bless you.